This conference is brought to you by CodeStack, React and React Native development experts. My name is Josh Gross, and I'm an engineer on the React Native core team at Facebook. For the past three years, the React Native team at Facebook has been re-architecting core pieces of React Native, and we've been testing rollout of them uh, within our own apps, including the flagship Facebook app. Today, I'll talk about just one part of that, the fabric renderer rewrite and rollout. React Native was originally built for iOS and then for Android. Today, React Native has renderers for VR, Windows, Mac OS, TV OS, and many other platforms as well. React Native is written and essentially rewritten in Java for Android, Objective-C for iOS, C++ for Windows, uh, and so on. Basically, every one of these platforms is a full, unique uh, re-implementation of React Native. And they attempt to behave the same way, but they, they don't all behave exactly the same way. In 2018, the React Native team embarked on a project to build a new architecture that would be future compatible. We wanted concurrent rendering, we wanted better performance and reliability, but we didn't want to build this n times for every platform. Ideally, we could build these features once using a cross-platform implementation and then deploy it to every platform. In order to accomplish this goal, we had to rewrite React Native. But we needed to make sure that we could bring along all of the apps in the world. Our first step was making sure that the rewrite would work in the biggest app in the world, the Facebook app. I'm going to focus today on our journey of rolling this out in the Facebook app. If you want more technical details, I highly recommend watching uh, these talks or some of these talks given by current and former members of the core team. The first one here is a high-level overview of all these projects by Ram N at React Conf 2018. There is a deep dive of Fabric given by David Vaca at React Native EU 2018. And there is a talk about the new architecture by Emily Janzer at React Native EU 2019. We will also be publishing more blog posts soon, so you can watch out for those as well. This will not be a technical talk. Um, I'm not going to be doing a technical deep dive into any uh, details of Fabric or its features. But instead, I'll describe our experience of using it at scale and migrating a very large code base to use only Fabric. This is going to be a story time. So sit back, relax, grab a warm beverage, or a, a, you can also grab a companion if you'd like. And I'll share with you our journey of deploying Fabric at scale at Facebook. So this is Marketplace in the Facebook app. Specifically, this is the Marketplace home surface. Marketplace consists of many, many surfaces. Other surfaces include product detail and commerce profile. All of these are built with React Native. In the Facebook app, React Native is used to build many other products as well. So dating and jobs um, and, and many other products. Altogether, there are over 1,000 surfaces in the Facebook app built with React Native. That's a lot. So I tweeted about this recently, and a lot of people were confused or didn't believe me or thought I misspoke. Some people thought I meant that React Native within Facebook has 1,000 components. I can assure you it's a whole lot more than 1,000 components. So when we talk about a surface within React Native at Facebook, what do we, what do we mean? Technically speaking, um, if you have an iOS or Android background, a surface would be like a full screen UI view controller on iOS or a fragment on Android, um, sort of roughly. Regardless, the assumption here is that if you navigate to a new surface in React Native at Facebook, we expect that surface to sort of take over and redraw the entire screen. So some of these can be relatively small. Say you go to a privacy policy surface, maybe it's just some text. But most of them, the vast majority, are much more complex. And some of them are huge with hundreds of features packed into a single surface. So I want to emphasize that number. 1,000 plus surfaces, however you want to think of it, is a huge number. Another unique part of our setup is that uh, at Facebook, um, all of our apps using React Native use React Native from the main branch of GitHub. So whenever we make a change to React Native or whenever we merge a pull request from GitHub, that change goes into our main developer build immediately. And then it goes live to all Facebook users in the next weekly release. 
This only gives us about a week to ensure that every change we make is stable on every one of those 1,000 plus surfaces for all of our users. So what does it mean to be stable? More than 1 billion people globally visit Marketplace each month. We have to make sure that Marketplace continues working well for people from different countries, with different network conditions, different device types. Since the launch of dating, over 1.5 billion matches have been created. So even the smallest regression in React Native easily affects product usage metrics, and that gets amplified by the scale of Facebook. A tiny performance regression of a few milliseconds will get caught and matters a lot. Incredibly rare race conditions or crashes that are one in a billion events will happen many times. It'll happen thousands of times a day. We've had to ensure that every screen, every metric, every interaction was working properly. In the meantime, the Facebook app is a moving target. Products and libraries built on top of React Native are constantly changing. They're being reworked and refactored. So in order to accomplish our goals of unifying React Native and enabling new features and better performance, we focused on stabilizing existing features and maintaining neutral metrics. So as part of this rollout, we specifically decided not to focus on improving metrics or expanding capabilities yet. We also made sure that any breaking changes were absolutely necessary and very easy to, to migrate and to roll out. I'm very proud to share that as of last month, React Native in the Facebook app is now completely powered by the new architecture. This doesn't mean, however, that it's quite ready for everyone to use right now, mostly because documentation is lacking, honestly, and some things like popular open source native modules may need to be updated. I'll say more about this towards the end of my presentation. So let's talk about the development and rollout process of Fabric. We modified our navigation system to support selectively turning on and off the architecture for individual surfaces um, and, and allowing us to control what percentage of users would get Fabric or the old renderer for a particular screen. Our work kind of followed the cyclical pattern. We would identify a surface, we would play around with it, we would we would investigate if we found any issues and, and try to fix them or implement a new Fabric feature um, that they were, were using that wasn't supported yet. We'd fix any of these issues, and then we'd run a production test. We'd analyze data, fix any issues that we found again, and then repeat the cycle. Pretty straightforward. After we kind of nailed the cycle and, and this workflow, all we had to do was repeat it a 1,000 times. It was easy. We just had this playbook, and we had to just keep doing it over and over and over again. We thought that this was going to be a six-month project. It's not a joke. Um, it took us about a full year before we realized the full scope of the migration. From the start, it took about two years to enable the architecture on the first surface, and nine months after that to enable Fabric on all the rest of the surfaces. So to be fair to us, our estimations were fairly close. Only five times off seems pretty good in the world of software estimations. So what challenges did we face? Well, first, um, we had challenges of scope. So the full scope of the project, like I said, wasn't realized until about a year into the migration. Our scope expanded a lot after the investigation kind of uh, went underway. Along the way, we discovered a lot of hidden features of React Native, as well as hidden and undocumented optimizations. I hinted towards this at the beginning, but we also found a lot of subtle differences between the Android and iOS code bases, the vast majority of which were not documented and the vast majority of which were not even intentional. They just sort of accidentally drifted over time. We discovered and documented and patched a lot of these and actually improved the non-fabric code base as well, but a lot of them couldn't be fixed without the fabric rewrite. Some of these platform differences over time had resulted in JavaScript product engineers writing platform checks and slightly different code for Android and iOS. So platform switches were sprinkled all across the Facebook code base. Thankfully, with the, the migration effort, we were able to delete many of these entirely because of the unified code base. So in this way, our production code has become much easier to read, much easier to reason about after the migration and the experience between Android and iOS users has, has, has been unified. One concrete example is that scroll view for Android has been almost entirely re rewritten internally 
compared to two years ago. And it's much more stable, performant, full featured, and in general, just higher quality and aligned with existing features that iOS had already, already had. Um, and a lot of these changes we were able to backport to the non-fabric renderer as well. Another example is layout animations, which was never fully supported in React Native on, on Android previously. It was always uh, flagged as sort of a, an experimental feature. Now it works well on both platforms with Fabric equally well. Another challenge for us in the migration was coming up with backwards compatible alternatives to APIs that we were deprecating. So this is a pain that nobody else will go through because we spent a lot of time making it easier for ourselves and for our own engineers internally to migrate code. In most cases, because of the time that we spent upfront, the migration work involved uh, just required deleting code because the new APIs are simpler in most cases and some of the changes involve just like using a best practice. Um, and uh, some of the APIs are simpler so we could just delete code. This applies to APIs used for rendering, for native modules, and for custom native components. Because we always ran screens uh, during this experiment in both Fabric and the non-Fabric render at the same time until the experimentation was complete, all code needed to be compatible with both. In the vast majority of cases, a surface's code didn't need to be modified at all to work in both Fabric and non-Fabric. We also encountered challenges with scale. First, there is a spectrum of instrumentation across the Facebook code base. Some surfaces have no instrumentation at all, besides sort of the basics that are provided for all surfaces. So our only signal might be crashes or bug reports. We would test these screens ourselves. We would rely on QA teams to do some manual testing. Um, but you know, this sort of lack of instrumentation could pose some challenges. Other surfaces have everything instrumented and would catch regressions of just a few milliseconds in performance with some specific interaction. These hyper-instrumented screens are, of course, also challenging, uh, but did offer us an opportunity to you know, kind of really make sure that Fabric is very performant in, in all corners of it. Um, another challenge we faced is that screens were hyper-optimized uh, specifically for the non-Fabric renderer. Um, and Facebook had, had really found like a local op, uh, a local maximum and a local optimum for for the the performance of these screens within the React Native renderer. Screens would rely on undocumented, undefined, and sometimes just unsupported behavior in order to squeeze out any performance win. Non-fabric code does some things incorrectly, but was sometimes faster because of it. A good example is measure APIs. The timing is not guaranteed. Previously to Fabric, it's not guaranteed. So there are many possible race conditions that can and do occur. And sometimes the measure API returns incorrect results because of it. But the API is very fast since it was optimized for speed and not correctness. We were eventually able to optimize the new Fabric APIs enough to, to get to, to parity with uh, many of these APIs or all these APIs. And Fabric is very performant now. But we did have this initial disadvantage um, because the non-fabric renderer had sort of an initial unfair advantage here, right, due to its trade-offs. Another challenge we faced is that Facebook is a moving target. Surfaces are being iterated on very quickly. So there are, again, I'll reiterate the number, a thousand plus surfaces. But this number is growing daily as well. And in addition, many of these screens are being worked on very, very actively. So new features are being released, old features are being deprecated, new metrics are being introduced, old metrics are being removed, metrics are being updated. And the baseline is sort of constantly shifting. Especially in the early days, in 2018 and 2019, we would try to experiment with screens that uh, didn't use as many features so that we could experiment with Fabric without having implemented all features necessary for the for the full implementation. So we'd implement, say, 50% of Fabric and then find a screen that only used sort of those 50% of features. The problem with this approach is that those screens could be updated at any time to introduce some usage of, of an unsupported feature. So um, this, was th this was a bit of a challenge, especially in the early days, because of how fast Facebook moves. Given all of that for context, 
Let's move back to the timeline. So hopefully it, it'll make a little bit more sense now. Through mid-2020, most of our time was spent discovering the scope of Fabric and re-implementing existing APIs for Fabric. We provided migration paths for a very small number of APIs that we are deprecating, like set native props and find node handle, and we provided replacements, backwards compatible replacements for them. We also migrated screens from using these deprecated APIs to using the new APIs. By the end of um, uh, like December 2020, we were 99% feature complete. Most of the 1,000 plus surfaces had Fabric enabled, but only for a very small number of users, so around 1%. By the end of 2020, 99% of surfaces were only using Fabric for all users. So that left only 1% of screens. But as you can imagine, that is because these 1% of screens were very important. Um, those were the very high volume, hyper optimized, hyper instrumented screens like Marketplace Home, for, for instance. These screens were extremely optimized specifically for the non-fabric renderer. So we had to spend a lot of time understanding the, the, the screens and these products and improving their performance specifically for fabric. Luckily, so when I say that, that we improved performance for fabric, Basically, this just meant adhering to best practices, no longer using all of these undocumented, uh, you know, sort of unsupported corners of React Native that, that people had been using, just using best practices, using some of the new APIs, using just the documented features. Six months later, those 1% of screens were migrated fully to Fabric as well. Now I'd like to tell um, a couple of interesting stories from my personal experiences with this rollout. So this is a real photo um, from very early on in the Fabric architecture discussions. And we spent a lot of time like this in the early days, huddled around a whiteboard with someone trying to explain to us or figure out how Fabric worked. Uh, sort of one person at the whiteboard explaining it and the rest of us just kind of staring confused until you know, it clicked. Um, and a lot of time in the, in the early days, it was us trying to pull ideas out of Sebastian's head, as you can, can see in, in this photo, until the ideas sort of clicked for the rest of us. I want to share these stories because I think they can reveal the scale of Facebook and, and how things can work internally. And I also want to emphasize, um, I expect the vast majority of people migrating to Fabric to never have any issues like this in part because we already went through all of this pain at Facebook. So this is part of the reason that we haven't encouraged Facebook adoption as much before. We wanted to iron out as many of the edges as possible. Another point here uh, to make is that some of these problems are specific to Facebook. So believe it or not, sometimes code within the Facebook app isn't perfect. I know that's hard to believe, but sometimes you know there's bugs that get introduced Sometimes there's suboptimal patterns um, that really shouldn't be used. And this did make um, getting feature parity and, and, and debugging harder. Um, so the, the, the first one of these stories I, I like to tell um, is that every November, like clockwork, um, there ends up being some big crash or bug that blocks my work in production. And every time it takes over a month to solve, usually well, well over a month, actually. Um, and this has been true every November that I've been at Facebook. So I'm really hoping it doesn't happen this November, but you know, we'll see. We'll have, to, we'll have to wait and see. So to give an insight into what my day-to-day -day looked like during the migration, um, I generally would wait until a new version of the Facebook app was released. So every week, a new version is, is released to production. I would wait 24 to 48 hours for you know, some significant chunk of users to, um, to update um, and then you know, have some time to use the app as well. And then I would analyze early crash data. So basically, I wanted to know, did Fabric crash more or less? And if it crashed more, I would do a deep dive into finding out what the issue was, and I would you know, try to fix it as soon as possible. Um, and if the crash is big enough, I would I would just like disable Fabric temporarily as well, obviously. As we were rapidly uh, implementing new features, especially in the early days in 2019 and 2020, 
we would get maybe usually like a maximum of one to two new crashes a week. Many weeks we got nothing, but if we got new crashes, it was like one or two. Most of these were very small volume, uh, very marginal, like one in a billion or one in a trillion type events. And most of them were very trivial, like a null pointer exception where the, the root cause is very obvious and the mitigation was like a null check, you know, like one line of code and, and the fix is easy. Um, but the reason I'm telling the story is that sometimes the crashes were not as easy to, to fix or root cause. So in one particular case, I got uh, an Android crash that was pretty high volume, so higher than I was comfortable with, um, and uh, uh, you know, much, much higher higher than the most crashes I had gotten. I looked into the stack trace, and there was no Facebook code involved, and there was no React Native code involved. Something in the internals of the Android UI layer was crashing. That's basically all I knew, and so initially I was going to just ignore it or punt it to another team. Um, but there was a clue that I had, was, which is that it was only crashing on React Native surfaces. And in addition to that, it was only crashing within uh, the sort of the Fabric experiment. So it was only crashing for React Native Fabric users on React Native screens, um, and only on a few screens as well. So there's you know, sort of very little for me to go on in terms of debugging, but it was very clear that it was actually a Fabric and React Native problem. Um, but yeah, React Native is huge. Our products are complicated. So uh, I didn't have that much information. So at this point, I did what I would normally do. I tried to reproduce the issue. Um, and of course, I couldn't after you know many, many hours of trying to reproduce it on different devices and different emulators. I just I couldn't reproduce it. My coworkers couldn't reproduce it. So the next step is to add logs. So hopefully I could get some logging information with a production crash telling me roughly what React Native was doing right before the crash, at least what section of code was executing um, before the crash. So I added logs over the course of a few weeks and predictably got no new information. Um, and because of the cadence of the releases of our apps, it takes a while to, you know, write the code to do logging to, to land it and then for that code to go into production. And so this is a pretty expensive process. Um, so it essentially took me a month and a half to get no new information. At this point, um, I wasn't just waiting. I wasn't just sitting around. I had already uh, looked into the data deeper and noticed uh, an unusual pattern, which is that it only reproduced on a few specific devices. That itself isn't that unusual, but it didn't reproduce on any Samsung devices or Google Pixel devices, which is very unusual. And in fact, it only reproduced on a few devices that are generally not used at all within uh, North America or within Europe at all. And uh, some of these devices, it's not even possible to buy within the US. Uh, so this is also a problem. Um, but at this point, you might be thinking, well, why did I just waste all this time? Why didn't I just buy one of these devices that like I could get my hands on? Uh, and the answer is pretty simple. I had never had to do that before. In, in all the times I'd, I'd done development before that and in all the time after it, I had never run into an issue this thorny that required that I have like one specific device. Um, and, and often, um, you know, I, I have run into a lot of device specific issues but usually there would just be a stack trace that indicated that like, oh, there's a null pointer exception that only happens on this one device, it happens in this code, dig in and, and it becomes clear after some investigation. Not, not so easy in this case. So I finally uh, got one of these devices and uh, in order to protect the innocence, I will not name the OEM. Um, and, but thankfully I was able to immediately reproduce the crash within 30 minutes of unboxing this phone. Hopefully you're curious at this point. Um, so the problem was that if you have an empty parent view on Android and you attempt to remove a child from it, so a view with no children and you want to remove a child with no parents from it, uh, Google, like Pixel, Samsung, stock Android will just fail silently and move on and don't do anything because the end result has already been achieved. You're trying to remove view from a parent with no children, so you can kind of kind of squint at it and say like, well, you've already achieved your goal, so we can just move on. 
but some OEMs have modified Android, I guess, to crash at this point. Um, and not only that, but uh, a, a few custom internal Facebook view managers on Android uh, did this in some, like, used this behavior in some marginal cases. This is notable and kind of funny to me because it's the first time I'd run into a case where the OEM had changed really core behavior in this way um, and changed basically an undocumented feature of Android without also any documentation. Um, so sort of just undocumented on, on both sides. It's really unclear you know, what to expect from this API without uh, digging into the code. It's also worth noting that this is kind of a classic design problem for APIs. If the user does something nonsensical, should you fail silently? Should you crash? Should you give them a warning? So there are pros and cons with any of these approaches. I don't think it's incorrect or correct for you know, stuck Android to just move on silently. I don't think it's correct or incorrect to, to crash at this point. They're just different decisions with different trade-offs. Um, and uh, you know, unfortunately, I ran into, into a case where sort of both decisions are made in different cases. Um, for closure here, fa Fabric became resilient to the sequence of operations, and Fabric now does just fail sort of silently in this case, um, although it logs something to the console if it happens. So technically, there is some clue here in case you have an, an issue and it's, and it's related to this. Um, another November bug I had was related to performance and event ordering. I, I believe that this was the, the previous, previous November, so about a year earlier. So earlier days in Fabric, I was testing a marketplace screen and I noticed that in Fabric, it would take like five seconds to load the screen. And most of the time, the screen was just blank. And I could tell uh, from like Metro logs that it wasn't like loading JavaScript. It wasn't really doing anything. It wasn't logging anything. It was just sitting there, as far as I can tell. So I did what we normally do for performance investigations. I collected log markers, which we have instrumented in React Native and in our product code. Um, and so I got sort of a linear sequence of events for the startup during Fabric and then during non-Fabric, and I would compare these timelines. And over time, I would drill down to find you know, which specific regions were slower in Fabric. Um, and you start, you, know, you add additional markers, so you can do like a binary search of where in this startup and which segments of code are slower. Um, and, and I basically just use this use this method and, and sort of rinsed and, and repeat it to dig down. Um, but I kind of exhausted that eventually. Um, and I ended up uh, using another tool, which is one of my, my favorite and most sophisticated uh, logging tools, which is logging text to the console using console.log. So I had a hunch here. I would add uh, logging statements all over the code base. I would collect text logs and fabric and then a non-fabric. I would literally copy and paste them into text edit, put them side by side on my monitor, and just comb through line by line. Um, you're probably horrified by this. After a couple times of doing this, I did end up using like more sophisticated diff tools to highlight the differences between them. But I was still ultimately just using console.log. Um, and what I ended up finding was pretty interesting, and it was that the ordering of some events was different in Fabric. So, these are like Android lifecycle events mixed with React Native lifecycle events and methods. The specifics don't matter here too much. And I, I want to emphasize that for the vast majority of even our surfaces in Facebook, like over 99% did not have any issues related to this. And most of those surfaces don't do anything with those lifecycle methods. So they're usually just not needed. But for a few surfaces that were highly customized, highly optimized for the, for the previous renderer, they were doing certain things to optimize startup. So they were using, they were doing sort of some, some special stuff in like Android fragment, on fragment create, on start, on stop, on activity results, sort of, th that's what I mean by lifecycle methods, um, mixed with React Native Java lifecycle methods like layout and, and measurement and, you know, again, startup, things like that. So again, the specifics don't matter. I just want to give you kind of a general idea of what kind of APIs were, were, were involved. Um, and so, yeah, so some of these events were happening in a different order in Fabric than they were happening in non-Fabric. 
So I thought, well, it's it's a long shot, but but I kind of followed my gut and dug further. And it turned out that the startup of the screen was constructed as a state machine, sort of an asynchronous state machine, where it expected event A to happen, and then event B asynchronously, and then event C. And if the sequence was was changed at all, the state machine just broke. So if the sequence, instead of being ABC, was ACB, startup just didn't work. And the screen would just sit there in, a, in sort of a perpetual loading state. Eventually, there was there, there is like a long running timeout that would force the screen to re-render um, so that users were never like truly stuck. Um, but the screen could appear more slowly in those cases. So I want to be clear here, I'm being intentionally vague because the specifics of like the APIs don't matter. This is one of those local maxima of performance that I mentioned earlier. We were doing something uh, sort of not great to squeeze milliseconds of performance out of React Native in the best case. Um, and I actually expect this optimization will go away entirely. This, this is like, again, an internal Facebook optimization. I think this, this will go away internally, uh, entirely in the future. It's not really as relevant with Fabric. Um, and I've never heard of anyone else doing this outside of Facebook. So before I continue, I just want to be clear. I don't expect anyone to run into this uh, scenario, period. Um, but why is the ordering, why, why is like this a problem if the ordering of events has changed slightly? And since it was causing us an issue, why didn't we just change fabric so that we could guarantee the previous ordering uh, of operations, even though it was never like documented or, or guaranteed? Why didn't we just do that? Well, since it was never documented or, or guaranteed, um, the ironic thing is that the sequence of events changed because we were able to optimize certain things in the internals of Fabric. So maybe that's still not convincing. You're saying it's, it wasn't documented, it wasn't guaranteed, but we still changed something that was working, right? So sort of. So this is where things like Facebook scale become important. It turned out that even uh, with the old system, the ordering of events was never consistent. So not only was it not guaranteed, not documented, but it also wasn't ever really consistent. So it would have this particular sequencing of events like 97, 98% of the time. And in Fabric, we had that expected sequencing of events only 90% of the time. So we always had this problem for some number of users, but we never realized it because it happened sort of too infrequently for our metrics to really like alarm on it. And internally, uh, nobody reproduced it. And so, you know, didn't catch it really in, in production. It wasn't a big enough problem in, in production to raise any alarm bells. And then internally, nobody was impacted by it. So we just uh, ignored it, <laughs> just never caught it. Um, the, the real problem is that, you know, basically, if you're building a state machine based on asynchronous events, you need to either know that the ordering of events is always going to be the same 100% 100 of the time, and then you have to add warnings or crash if you ever encounter a different ordering. Or you can be resilient to different orderings of events. Um, this is a hard problem. Um, you know, async programming is difficult. Uh, state machines are difficult to get right. But especially at scale, it's crucial to get this correctly. If you assume a particular ordering and it's wrong for 1% or 5% of users, that's, that's a huge number of people at scale. So long story short, we were able to fix this issue by making our product code more resilient to different orderings of events. And in so doing, we actually also improved the user experience for both Fabric and non-Fabric and Im improved performance for both as well. So again, I want to reiterate, for the vast majority of difficult issues we face with, say, poor interactions between product code and Fabric, Fixing the issue for Fabric also improved the user experience for non-Fabric because generally the issue was caused by usage of like undocumented APIs, undocumented behavior, or just like not using best practices. Um, and um, yeah, so so we we end we ended up uh, as part of this process also um, spending a lot of time thinking about and analyzing the ordering of events in React Native and Fabric, um, and, and sort of ways of solving this class of problems in general. Um, and what I, what I will say is that it really illustrated how important it is 
both for APIs to document any assumptions and constraints they have, but also that it's very important as a, as a developer, as a user of APIs, for me to keep an eye on what is not documented. So if documentation was perfect, it would just call out explicitly that something is subject to change. Um, but obviously, that doesn't always happen. And, and now when I notice a gap in documentation, when I'm looking for something and I kind of can't find it, sometimes now I wonder if that's almost intentional. Sometimes maintainers don't want to provide guarantees, because if you do, then people rely on them, and then that causes parts of the systems to become less flexible. Again, uh, I don't expect, frankly, anyone outside of Facebook to be impacted by this. Most people will never use or think about these events that were involved. Um, as a side note, one thing that we thought about uh, doing internally to force product code to be more resilient is to have like a chaos monkey event mode, where for you know, developers only, in some cases, we would just randomly delay events or reorder some events. Um, so we haven't done this yet. If you hear Facebook engineers complaining about it in the future, maybe, it's, maybe that's my fault. Um, but I, I actually suspect that doing this sort of thing would catch a lot of bugs and like future bugs in waiting. Finally, um, it's taken us a you know a very long time to fully migrate the Facebook app onto the new React Native architecture. We're very proud of this moment, and you know, uh, very proud of all the work that went into it. But we know that we are we are we are not done yet, and our next step is to bring it to all of you. We're starting to plan this work now. We're clearly you know very bad at estimating, so I'm not going to make any claims for dates. Um, so while we don't know how long this full process will take, we, we do know the next steps. We're currently working on tutorials and guides to help people take advantage of the new architecture. We're partnering uh, closely with companies like Expo, Callstack, and Software Mansion, um, as well as maintainers of the most popular packages in open source to make sure that they're compatible with the new architecture. It's very, very important for us that this upgrade goes as smoothly as possible for everyone, and we really can't wait to get to get it into all of your hands. I am but one part of a, of a pretty large team, uh, and this effort involved a lot of people, including a lot of engineers within Facebook that are, that are not on the React Native team. Too many people to count. Um, but within the team, I'd like to give a big thanks and recognition to the people that I've been working with daily for the past few years. So especially David Vaca, Samuel Susla, and Valentin Shurgin. Big thanks. This is a huge effort. Thank you for uh, making my life easier and, and, and helping me out along the way. Um, I'd also like to thank our leadership who supported such a huge ambitious rewrite, especially when it took years longer than expected. Um, so big shout outs here to Tom Aquino, Tim Young, Yuzi Zhang, Kevin Gazali, and Eli White. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on GitHub.